This meeting is being recorded. Good, e good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Planning Commission meeting of Thursday, February 17th, 2022. Um, before we go into the agenda, I just want to let uh, anyone that is listening from the public know that part of our meeting this evening will be a public hearing. Um, I will give you instructions about how to participate in that hearing uh, when we get to that point in the agenda. In the meantime, um, feel free to listen in. Uh, please don't raise your hand until the public hearing has opened and please don't um, participate in any online chats um, that are available to you um, because it's a bit of a distraction to us. So um, having said that, uh, let's get rolling with the uh, roll call. Commissioner Soltis. Here. Commissioner Bradbury. Here. Commissioner Krawczyk. Here. Commissioner Greiner. Here. Commissioner Bennett. Here. Commissioner Brown. Here. And I'm Greg Huxma, chair of the commission. Also from the city, we have Carl DeSemus, Katrina Knudsen, and Michelle Thomas. So well, thank you all for attending well, and a special well, thanks and welcome to um, the members of the public that have chosen to attend this evening. Next item on the agenda is the approval of our of minutes. We have two sets of minutes that we need to approve. Are there any corrections to those minutes? If not, I am willing to entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I will uh, move to approve both sets of minutes. Second. Okay. Second. Commissioner Bennett seconds that. That was Krasik on the first. I will open the floor to discussion about the minutes. No discussion. We can move on to a vote. All those in favor of approving the minutes say aye. 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 Everyone says aye, so the motion passes unanimously. Okay, so that didn't take long. Um, before we get to the public hearing though, I am gonna um, ask Katrina Knutson from the Community Development Department of the city um, to go through a PowerPoint that will uh, be helpful for those that are in, in attendance uh, to understand uh, exactly what we're discussing tonight. So I'll turn the floor over to you, Katrina. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. And just one other thing, if everyone can be sure that their microphone is on mute, uh, that'll help us all out. Let's move you guys over just a little bit so I can see you. Okay. Good evening, commissioners and public who are listening in. Tonight, we're here for a public hearing on Ordinance 1466, which are interim zoning controls related to transitional housing, uh, emergency housing and emergency shelters. Just a very quick background and commissioners bear with me that you heard most of this at your last uh, few meetings, but the city is working on this largely due to um, a substitute house bill that was passed on May 12th, 2021. And that was regarding transitional housing, permanent supportive housing and emergency shelters. This bill again was largely passed due to the, uh, the growing affordable housing crisis in the and also homelessness crisis within Washington state and in particular the Puget Sound area. The bill requires all jurisdictions to undertake immediate and long term amendments to their development regulations and comprehensive plans. And we'll get into that a little bit later, but some require attention now and some can be done in our comprehensive plan update. And again, in response to this action by the state, the city adopted interim zoning controls in September of last year for a six month period that essentially established regulations pertaining to those uses above uh, in an interim period to be evaluated again by staff and the planning commission and then going forward to council for potential uh, full adoption into the city's municipal code. Quickly, brief definitions of what these are. Uh, transitional housing means a project that provides housing and supportive services to homeless persons or families uh, for up to two years and has the purpose of facilitating the movement of homeless persons and families into independent living. 
Uh, and as you can see, all of these definitions are either codified in the RCW or the Washington State Administrative Code. Uh, permanent supportive housing subsidized leased housing with no limit to length of stay paired with on-site or off-site voluntary services designed to support a person living with a disability to be successful tenant in a housing arrangement, improve the resident's health status and connect residents of the housing with community-based healthcare treatment and employment services. Emergency shelters are a place of supportive services and safe temporary lodging offered on a 24 hour, seven day per week basis to victims of domestic violence and their children. And emergency housing is a facility whose primary purpose is to provide temporary or transitional shelter and supportive services to the homeless in general or to a specific population of homeless for no more than 60 days. The city council actions on this already, they conducted a public hearing after we adopted interim regulations. They adopted findings pursuant to that ordinance at a step after the public hearing, and they directed that the planning commission consider what was adopted to see if there were any tweaks that needed to be made and requested a formal recommendation. Quick very brief overview of this long bill. Section one amended the Growth Management Act, essentially requiring cities to uh, update their housing chapters. This is um, the language no longer encourages affordable housing, but requires for jurisdictions to plan for it. This is not an immediate action, and this is something that we will lead the Planning Commission through an effort of an housing, a housing action plan starting this year and to be adopted fully in the 2024 update. Section two of the bill also amended the Growth Management Act to require jurisdictions to inventory, analyze, plan for, and accommodate dwelling units for moderate, low, very low, extremely low households. Um, again, this is another item that does not need to be done right now and is not done through the ordinance that you're considering. However, these definitions of moderate, low, very low, extremely low, those vary by jurisdiction. I know there was a question at a previous planning commission meeting about what that uh, income level is for, for the city of Gate Harbor specifically. And as part of that housing action plan, we'll be working through the demographics of that, working through what those um, annual income ranges would be for our city in particular. And again, this is another item that we will be starting this year and would not be due to be finalized until the 2024 update is uh, due to the state in June of 2024. Section three uh, is the section that we're largely here to discuss tonight. And this section preempted local authority from prohibiting certain shelters and housing types. The bill did add a section to uh, 35A21 that a code city shall not prohibit transitional housing or permanent supportive housing in any zones which residential dwelling units or hotels are allowed. A city code shall not prohibit indoor emergency shelters or indoor emergency housing in any zones which hotels are allowed. And as we'll see on a few slides later, that is what we have, uh, what this ordinance proposes is to be consistent with primarily this section. Uh, section four does not pertain, of the bill does not pertain to the city because we are a code-based city. Um, section five of the bill amended the Growth Management Act to prohibit jurisdictions from utilizing interim controls to prohibit uh, intake of building permit applications for any of the uses that I described earlier. Um, and then section six adds the definitions of emergency shelter housing and moderate income household, as those were not previously codified in the WAC or the RCW. So the specifics for Gig Harbor, transitional housing and permanent supportive housing pursuant to this state law would need to be allowed in all of our zones except for PI and ED. Uh, staff proposed to council and it was adopted that these be conditional use permits that require a hearing in front of the, uh, the hearing examiner and would also be subject to um, meet certain conditions um, such as noise, traffic, et cetera. We've placed those regulations in the ordinance and uh, in a new chapter 1755 to specify those conditions. For emergency shelters and emergency housing, those would be again conditionally allowed in RB2B or sorry, DB 
P2, C1, and PCDC. And those are the zones within the city where hotels are currently allowed. And as you'll recall from a few slides prior, that was the um, requirement from the bill that emergency shelters and emergency housing be allowed in zones where hotels are allowed. Again, hey, staff has recommended- Katrina? Yes. Excuse me, but would, for the sake of our guests, would you mind just say, letting them know what PIED and those other acronyms stand for quickly? Yes, Carl, correct me if I'm wrong. Public Institution and Employment District are the first two. RB2 is, I can't think of it right, Residential Business 2. Uh, DB is Downtown Business. D2 is Business 2. Um, C1 is commercial one, so the lowest level commercial, and then PCDC is the planned, I'm gonna get it planned wrong. Com planned community development commercial. There we go. And it is a Harbor Hill development agreement specific zone that's only in, in that area of town. Thank you for that, Chair. We get into our acronym world and it's um, appreciated that you bring us out of that. <laughs> Um, and so, as I mentioned, again, these would be conditionally allowed, so they would require public notification within uh, 300 or 500 feet of a proposal for one of these, so citizens would be uh, noticed of this and be able to comment to the hearing examiner. Again, there would be conditions associated with that. The alternatives to both of these would be either a straight approval, where it would be uh, approved outright, or an administrative approval, which I can do at my level. For all four of these uses, staff talked about it and these are uh, could be fairly, um, not intensive uses, but uses that may need to have conditions established to them, which is more readily done at the hearing examiner level. And also the administrative approval uh, does not require notice necessarily and does not require a public hearing. And on all four of these, we thought that the, the best course of action would be to allow for a public hearing. These maps visually depict what I've talked about on previous slides. The green is all of the zones that dwelling units and hotels are permitted. And you can see that depicted in green. So there's very few areas of the city in which transitional housing and permanent supportive housing would not be allowed. On the right side in red, you can see the affected areas where um, the zones that hotels are currently permitted by our zoning code. And those are the zones where emergency shelter and emergency housing would be able to locate. So the proposed planning commission actions for now would be to conduct the public hearing, uh, ask any questions of staff, and then make a formal recommendation to the city council. And if I may, after our meeting with you the last time, we took an extra good look at the ordinance. And so items that we're recommending the planning commission include in their recommendation would be these modifications to the ordinance. Under section two, you can see here where it says 17 and then 55 in red, this previously said 57. For proper legislative drafting, we need to have the 55 come before the 57. And so you can see that we now have 55, 1755 here, and it's the same here now and here, and then down below, we've corrected the numbering to be 1757 because that comes after 55, It's just a clerical error. So in your recommendation to council, we would recommend that those clerical errors be corrected. Additionally, there was one more error that we found in the original ordinance, and that was for uh, WR, WM, and WC, Waterfront Residential, Waterfront Millville, Waterfront Commercial, the previous ordinance had permanent supportive housing and transitional housing as not being allowed. However, in order to be consistent with the adopted state law, uh, <clears throat> residences are permitted in all three of those zones. And therefore we would recommend that the planning commission add a C under 
all three of those zones for both permanent supportive housing and transitional housing as outlined here. And we do try to be as perfect as possible, but we fortunately found these errors before it got through the planning commission process and we appreciate your help in correcting them. And with that, staff is available for any questions prior to the hearing. Okay, thanks for that um, that reminder there, Katrina. And, and notice how I skillfully asked you to inform our guest about what those acronyms stood for. It was actually for me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> okay, open the floor to uh, any questions or clarifications from the commissioners to the staff. Okay. Uh, Greg, may I ask one question here? Of course. Uh, uh, Katrina, I have a question regarding the uh, conditional approval. You mentioned something along the lines of that some of these conditions are taken care of by the design review board, perhaps as opposed to actually putting them into the ordinance. Uh, I was thinking in terms of an occupancy requirement uh, for one thing. Um, is that something that would be addressed when you got to the lower level design review? For occupancy specifically, the building division, specifically the building official will be looking at any applications for these to ensure that proper occupancy limits are set. Um, as far as the design review board, much of the design would be likely taken care of at least for the residential components of this could be done administratively um i'm not sure if there's a specific type of condition that you were thinking yeah i was thinking along the lines of um making sure that whatever organization that manages these uh shelters or facilities uh is well qualified has a uh, background has the kind of typical thing you'd want to do to know about to address the health and safety of the community. Are these uh, solid citizens that have done this before that have been approved by Pierce County, some kind of mechanism like that? Uh, is there going to be proper safety and health requirements addressed for uh, just the safety of the occupants and, 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 and the concern of the safety of the residents? Kind of concerned about how that gets addressed properly to make sure people are um, are well served in the community. Yeah, I think that would probably, that, that would be a good amendment to make to the ordinance to include a condition regarding, think just thinking off the cuff, a condition that it must be managed by a licensed um, nonprofit or agency that would look at those items that you said. I think that could be an amendment included in the, Planning Commission recommendation. Okay, thank you. Because our the ordinance, you're correct, does not state that right now. Okay, Commissioner Brown. I, I'm interested in the definition of the uh, emergency shelters. Just who who would be sheltered? What what would the qualifications be in order to be eligible to? use the emergency shelters? Um, currently, the emergency shelter definition is a place of supportive services, temporary lodging offered on a 24 hour, seven day per week basis to victims of domestic violence and their children. So it's only victims of domestic violence. I mean, suppose we had a, uh, <clears throat> a fire in a neighborhood that destroyed a bunch of houses. Would, those people would not be victims of domestic violence, but they'd certainly need shelter. Can you tell me whether there's any circumstances under which people other than victims of domestic violence would have access to the emergency shelters? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think we addressed this at the last meeting a little bit, but essentially the emergency shelters that are being talked about here that are defined in RCW 7, uh, 7123020 
are of um, a shelter that would be a permanent structure that would be there kind of for a, a continuous emergency basis on an emergency for individual emergencies. The emergency shelters um, that you're talking about are a different set under different codes that are for, you know, either natural disasters or um, community-wide emergencies. And those are typically um, temporary shelters uh, because the, I mean, we would hope that the emergency would not be long-term. And so those are taken care of under a different section of state code. So this ordinance essentially would not disallow those temporary emergency shelters. Thank you. Other questions? I will note also, Chair, the, the reason that we're not proposing to um, put these currently in our definitions, in our code, is because they are based on the state law. And so we know that the state could change these definitions um, at any time. And we wouldn't want the administrative headache of having to go in and change our definitions to meet the state's. So by having them reference to the state, we're ensuring that we're always up to date on what that is. I like that strategy. Work smarter, not harder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions before we move to the public hearing portion of the meeting? <clears throat> Okay, so at this time, I will open the public hearing. To speak during the meeting, please press the raise hand button near the bottom of your Zoom window or press star nine on your phone. <clears throat> um, please refrain from raising your hand um, until I get done with this little ditty here. Your name and the last four digits of your phone number will be called out when it is your turn to speak. When using your phone to call in, you may need to press star six to unmute yourself. Everyone will have up to three minutes to speak and Michelle Thomas with the city um, at the three minute mark will turn your speaker off and mute you. Um, please confine your um, comments to uh, the subject at hand. Um, and I would just like to add a comment that um, we had solicited written public comments and have uh, had received none. So um, I will start to identify any, anyone that raises their hand. And if you would please um, state your name and your address before you um, speak and your three minutes won't start until you're done uh, telling us your name and address. So I will switch over here. You see the participant list. And Josie Turner, you are first up. Uh, mine is more of a question than a comment. Um, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you, but I just want to let you know this is not a, an interactive session. Okay. This is an opportunity for you to express uh, your opinion um, about that. We uh, have the liberty as the commissioners, if we need something, some clarification on something that you say to ask you a question, but it uh, unfortunately doesn't work the other way around for you. Um, so if I, if I just wanted to question, that's not appropriate. I apologize. Oh, no worries. <laughs> no worries. The, um, and Katrina, I don't know if if you want to clarify that or not, or or hear her question and you know see what we might be able to do. Um, no, you're you're following the correct protocol. I would say that you know we could hear it and you know maybe address it later, or if in her comment she'd like to give a phone number or email address, and Carl or I can get back to her. Okay. How's that sound, Jody? Do you want to, Would you like to make a comment and and uh, and put a question in there that maybe the staff can get back to you about? Right. So um, I I contribute to um, an organization that um, helps uh, international refugees 
um, from countries that uh, are, you know, in distress or people that are fleeing war-torn places. And um, I have a place in my home, an apartment that I don't rent out, but I'm wondering if that would fall into the purview of a homeless or a emergency shelter because in a way they, it is an emergency shelter because they're always saying can can we send somebody to stay with you for until we find other housing and I've been reluctant to do that so um that's that's simply my question okay thank you very much for your comment and um I think perhaps uh, if you could email Michelle Thomas, um, and you can, you know, it's just michelle.thomas. Yeah, I, when I signed in, I put my email. Is that uh, enough? Yeah, I think if you provide your, send your question or just a recap, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Josie Turner, the one that, okay. that asked All the right. question. She'll, yeah, she'll get back to you. Um, and, and either her or one of the uh, other staff members. All right, thank you very much. Okay. Let's see. Um, Jania Worley, did I get that right? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, uh, Janae Worley. 3405 Erickson Street, apartment D as in dog five, Gig Harbor, Washington, 98335. Welcome. Um, comment? I believe that uh, it would be uh, crucial to maybe fix some of the wording in the fact that the shelter should and maybe necessarily provide emergency services during the winter. When I read over the ordinance, it stated transitional housing, certain set amount of space in between, shelter, so many spaces, how many is allowed. Um, just domestic violence is a bit of a concern and having an emergency shelter that is set up per incident versus per year round may be something that has to be looked at because of winter situations and other weather phenomenon that happens, um, heating during the summertime, overheating, so cooling centers. So it may be apt to add some wording that would give us a little bit more room on what we can and cannot do shelter-wise. Okay, thank you for that comment. I see a couple other folks that are listening in. Um, do you have an interest in making a statement or a comment? Okay. Oh, EW, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, Elizabeth Wright, I don't live in the city. I live uh, right outside of the city limits, but I wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, the first is that um, I'm wondering the extent to which the council would advocate that some or all of the housing uh, and or the shelter um, have uh, some sort of uh, priority, not, necessar not necessarily exclusivity, but priority for um, people who were residents of Gig Harbor as opposed to people from anywhere. So perhaps a prioritization, if you will, um, to take care of people in the community first. And my second comment is that um, picking up on the comment that was made about a licensed nonprofit, I think which everybody um, echoed the same sentiment, I would add to that 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 licensed nonprofit should really demonstrate a proven successful record uh, of past performance of implementation of projects of similar uh, scope as the one being contemplated for Gig Harbor. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. So, um, 
There's only one other and she doesn't seem to be raising her hand. So at this point, I am going to officially close the uh, public comment portion and close the public hearing. Chair, I, if you don't mind, I could address some of those. Sure. At least the questions, I, since there's not too many comments. Um, yeah, well, I think, it, I think it'll help us as we have our discussion after, you know, afterwards as well. Thank you. Okay. The, the apartment situation, if it's just an apartment that's, let's say, a two-bedroom apartment and, you know, she resides in one bedroom and there's additional bedroom and have someone come and stay with her for a while, that would not be subject to this ordinance. Um, that would just be seen under the apartment or, or residence um, that she has. Of course, if it's more than that or if it's going to be more than one person or it could trip occupancy, you know, uh, feel free to give our front line a call at 253-851-6170 and somebody from the building division could um, assist with occupancy questions or if it's a land use question, the planning division would be happy to help. But from what the, the commenter said, it did not appear that it would be subject to this ordinance. Um, in terms of the weather um, hot cold, I just want to reiterate that these this ordinance is for um, the emergency shelters that are being discussed in here would be for permanent shelters that would go through permanent land use approval that would require a conditional use permit. We're not speaking of uh, things that are for natural disasters or for heating cooling areas that are, are temporary in nature, such as what has happened uh, Chapel Hill, uh, you know, when we got really cold not too long ago. This ordinance does not govern those. There are separate laws that govern that. This is specifically for uh, brick and mortar emergency shelters that are for long term uh, that would have a, a lasting conditional use permit on them that would be granted land use authority. So I um, just want to further clarify that those two are separate things and this one would be again a permanent structure that would have a conditional use permit that would run with that land. In terms of requirements for city residents, the state law does not allow us to do that. Uh, so we could not put in a provision for Gig Harbor only. Um, however, I did think that the commenter's language uh, regarding the licensed nonprofit demonstrating a successful record, I think that that you know, could be added to the amendment that Commissioner Soltis may make. I think that would be consistent with the state law or at least not inconsistent with the state law. Okay, thanks for those uh, clarifications. And, and if I could just um, make an additional comment, because I think the, the, the land, for those that are, that are listening, I think the language is a little bit confusing um, in all the, in, in the ordinances. And, and if you don't like, live land use and um, and we as the planning commission don't live it every day either and and have to be have you know be refreshed about what the language means sometimes but the bottom line is that the, these would be I guess in the pure sense a freestanding building that was built an emergency shelter that would be built with the intent to provide housing to victims of domestic violence, and that that would be the sole use of that building um, on that piece of land. Now, at any given moment, um, there it might be full or it might be empty or it might be somewhere in between, but the, the designated intent of the building is just, is just for that specific purpose, and that's to provide emergency shelter for a victim of domestic violence who the police go to a house and and um or a woman and her child run away from a man and i say that because that's the most common scenario uh, and they have a place to go and stay safely um and so with the other the other two building types it's the same thing that it would be uh, a purpose-built building or a current standing building that was purchased 
with the specific intent to change it into this function. So um, if that helps you all to understand, um, uh, it, it, I think perhaps um, that'll clarify things a little bit. And hopefully I didn't get any of that wrong, Katrina. No, that's a good explanation. And if if the commission's ready to make or begin on a recommendation, you could, uh, for the Scribner's error and administrative error items that I discussed earlier, you could make those under one amendment and just say as shown through the presentation tonight, because we have it recorded and it was shown what you saw and what, so the direction would be clear, essentially. So you would need to make a recommendation for each error. Okay, well, are there uh, any other comments um, from the commissioners, especially uh, specifically with respect to um, uh, the comments that we heard from the public? Go ahead, Commissioner Krasik. Okay, well, I, I just want to add my support for what uh, Bob Soltis says, that it must be operated by a licensed organization and also uh, Elizabeth Wright's comments and the, the term I used there was demonstrated competency. That if somebody's going to uh, operate one of these shelters, they will have uh, demonstrated that in fact, uh, that uh, uh, they are knowledgeable and, and have the uh, resources and training to do this. And uh, Greg, I also wanted to uh, second uh, what you said about clarifying to make uh, these more specific in terms of what uh, these shelters are actually going to be doing. There were uh, a couple of other things that I thought of as I was listening to the comments. And one, I don't know if this has ever risen in the city of Gig Harbor, but I know that in some areas, undocumented immigrants have been given sanctuary in churches uh, for, for them to uh, avoid arrest and deportation. Is there anything uh, in this ordinance that conflicts or uh, addresses that situation, Katrina? No, that does not. That is not addressed in this ordinance. There's a whole other set of case law that determine what churches can and can't do, and that is not subject to this ordinance. Okay, so that's something that would have been addressed by the courts. Yes. And the the second thing that I uh, that occurred to me is I know sometimes that. People have relatives in the emergency room in the hospital, and sometimes it becomes a long drawn out process. If the hospital were to be able to provide like travel trailers or other sorts of uh, that kind of shelters in their parking lot for these people to remain overnight, would that be permitted under this policy, under this ordinance? Give me one minute. I don't believe that that would be covered under this. The, the reason I say that is the transitional housing and the permanent supportive housing, those are talking about actual homes that are being converted or used for the purpose of transitional housing or people who are transitional. That doesn't mean that someone who's staying or needs shelter from the hospital couldn't stay in one of those shelters, but this would not be, um, we would not permit a dwelling unit per se on the hospital property. Um, and emergency shelters and emergency housing are specific, again, for domestic violence or people at risk of homelessness. And so I don't see that either any of these four would cover that. Would it prohibit that? I don't think that this ordinance per se would prohibit that. I do think currently there are other land use controls that would prohibit that from happening. Okay. Thanks, Katrina. Very good questions, though. Uh, Commissioner Greiner? 
Uh, I just wanted to clarify, Katrina, um, this, the public person's comment about um, giving Gig Harbor residents priority. I know that you said that it couldn't only be for Gig Harbor residents, but is is can it be that um, local residents have priority? And if I, I just wanted to clarify, because she's she didn't say that it would only be she was she was suggesting that local residents have priority. So that's that's my question. I will need to check with legal counsel on that. However, okay. if the planning commissioners, I, I definitely see where you and the commenter are, are, are coming from on that. And if the planning commission were to make that recommendation, um, I would recommend that it would be, um, you know, that we give Gig Harbor and residents priority at these facilities um, if allowed by law or something like that. <clears throat> okay. And then we can check with the city attorney tomorrow. And if he says yes, then we'll put it in the ordinance. And if not, we'll follow up with the commission. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Soltis. A couple of kind of just detailed questions for Katrina and Carl. Uh, you placed a, a limit of uh, 40 people or 10 families on the, one of the uh, types of housing in the as one of the conditions. And I, could you circle back for a little bit to see why we we're talking 40? I, I think you would refer, referred at one point in time to a discussion you had with the police chief. Um, is, is that your data source for making it 40 based on that conversation? Are you under section three of the ordinance? It's section three, okay. uh, part one, uh, part uh, A, occupancy will be limited to 10 or 40 people, 10 families or 40 people. Yeah, this, this section, and again, it was a, uh, it was a collaborative process, I will say. Um, there's, there wasn't any perfect number for us to put in here. And so what we did was look at what other cities have done that have already implemented this of our size, such as Bonnie Lake, um, Sumner, et cetera. And these are the numbers that they utilized. So in a professional sense, I will say we borrowed uh, this condition from their regulations. I will say that this is also not inconsistent with the intel from the police chief. And again, if the problem, if the homelessness problem around in and around Gig Harbor, you know, exceeds where it is now, and we find that there's more pressure, then we can always open up this ordinance for for revision. But we thought it was a good um, that it provided relief now to try it here in the harbor, at least, you know, since we don't have anything that way, and we also didn't want to allow an exorbitant amount that could have the public potentially up in arms from this new use that has not been allowed here before. I know that's not a, a science, but it's kind of how we came up with that. Will you refine that number when you do the housing study coming, to, coming down the road? Will that be part of the lowest income estimates you're gonna to have to be making? It's got to be more of a formal process, I, I presume, as you go over the next year or so. It's a really great, Point, uh, Commissioner Soltis. Another recommendation that the commission could make that necessarily wouldn't amend the ordinance, but could be a general recommendation would be to reconsider the ordinance that's passed once the housing action plan is completed. Greg, I have a couple more if I may. Sure. Uh, the question is Katrina and Carl, in terms of unincorporated Pierce County and Kitsap are, are basically our neighbors, um, have they got to operate under the same new law? Do they have to uh, amend their codes and prepare for the possibility of these kinds of facilities? And if they do, how coordinated are we all together on this? Another really great question. The answer is we're not very well coordinated right now. I think that's why we're seeing a lot of housing bills going forward in 
the state legislature right now because up until two years ago, there was no funding for looking at housing, housing affordability or homelessness. The cities have and counties have just now been receiving this funding um, again for housing action plans to move forward and require the coordination. So we're hopeful that over the next one to four years, we can become more uh, cohesive together on these issues. But as of right now, we are not. And the answer to if um, they must play by this as well, the answer is yes. One question, is, another question is on transportation, local transportation lines. Uh, it seems to me that any facility like this must be close to public transportation to really be uh, to be or serve serve the, its residents. Um, is that did you guys draw an overlay on um, the bus lines to, to are they all within these areas? It would seem to me basically you need to be close to a bus line if you put one of these places in. Otherwise, it's going to be. Um, very, very un, untenable for the people that actually are staying there. Yeah, the city concurs with you and through our um, legislative delegation and our lobbyists, when this bill was being considered, we, along with other AWC um, um, Association of Washington Cities, lobbied for the, the transit component that it, you know, be within a half a mile of, of transit or rapid transit. And the bill that ended up passing again was they need to be allowed in, and they did it zone specific based on the use. So for the emergency shelters, they said any zone that allows hotels. And so that didn't say to us any zone that allows hotels that's within half a mile of a transit stop. So um, we did not overlay transit on our maps because it was not a consideration that we could disallow something for. Okay, thank you, Kriya. All right, Commissioner Brown, I think you were next. Thank you, yeah. I did not understand what our ordinance was saying about increasing residential density. So could you kind of explain that, please? I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to. Well, <clears throat> Wasn't there something in the state bill that said you can't prohibit uh, multi-dwelling zoning? And doesn't our ordinance address that? Um, are you speaking about the housing bill that was going forward recently? No, well, I'll tell you what. I can't get I can't get that document up on my screen at the same time that I'm looking at you. So maybe I'll uh, just send you an email reference, and uh, that's the best I can do right now, I guess. Okay, um, Chair, if 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 at the end of this, once we have the recommendation, I'm happy to give an update on the the Joint House Senate bill that was going to increase residential densities that was gonna affect Kick Harbor. I, I can give the commission an update. Okay, yeah, thanks. All right, Commissioner Bennett, you're up. All right, thank you. Um, the One of the questions that I have is more related to uh, the term temporary. When they talk about temporary indoor accommodations um, and is there anything that we would need to do or any concern in terms of what temporary means and how long someone would actually stay at a place like this? Um, is there any concern that someone might come and turn it into more of a, a long-term situation or is there some situation in which temporary requires these the people who come to the emergency shelter to be gone after a certain amount of time? Or I'm, I'm just kind of curious what we're considering temporary. Are you referring, are you speaking of the emergency shelters? Um, the term, yeah, under section three here, uh, number or the letter F. Okay. Hmm. 
So again, as we're borrowing these definitions from the state, um, I can look up what temporary means in the Webster's Dictionary, which is what our code <laughs> requires us to look at. I don't think that we could further limit what temporary means under this code, although I definitely see where you're going with that and why that would be important. Carl, what do you think? Sorry, I was just uh, I was just reading that as well. Um, you know, I think in, in answer to a couple of these questions, I believe that these uh, this type of housing will be regulated uh, as well by a state agency. And so I think some of what we're discussing as far as, uh, you know, how long a stay would be allowed there, uh, you know, whether the operator is is licensed. Um, and those sorts of issues, some of that, I think, is is going to be um, worked out through uh, a state agency that has oversight for this type of use, much like a like a daycare center or something like that, where we we as the local jurisdiction would permit that um, that use. But there would be a state agency that would be overseeing uh, the licensing of that use, something like liken it to liquor control board or something like that. Um, and so I think that uh, likely there would be some some rules and regulations relative to um, the term temporary or dictate how long somebody could stay there. I, I don't know that for sure, Commissioner Bennett. So I'm, I am surmising just a little bit. Uh, I think it's a really um, good question. I think it's a good point. Um, don't have don't I don't have, yeah we don't have a ready a ready-made answer for it, unfortunately. Without that, Carl, it's a wild, wild west. How do you have any kind of uh, consistency across these areas? You, you've got to have some body, other than, or, or is it going to be the city of Gig Harbor that jumps into that? And I, I think the answer to that is probably you hope not, because that's outside your purview, I think. Um, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, think, I think all of this is is managed by the homeless housing and assistance program under chapter 43 of the state code. Um, and so I think that, the, you know, I think there's other requirements that we're not gonna have in our code because we are not gonna be the ones checking the backgrounds of the companies who are running these places. Um, they would need to have state approvals, something similar to, you know, the city can't approve um, a health liquor license or approve, you know, if, um, you know, food is being um, prepped properly. There's other agencies that, you know, step in. So from our perspective, what the city would have control over, it would be what's in this ordinance. I, uh, I do have a quick question. I wasn't able to determine from the legislation, uh, will joint use facilities be permitted or is that up to the city? Joint use facilities are not a requirement to allow here. And so I would say that that would be up to the city and currently we would not allow those. Okay, thank you. You guys are so smart. <laughs> Good question. They are. Well, I, I would just reinforce it, it you know, what Carl said, because that, that's kind of been the, the question that's been nagging at me ever since the, um, uh, Elizabeth White made the comment that, you know, how do you know they know what they're doing? Um, so it's reassuring to know. And, and as you were talking, Carl, it, it occurred to me that it, it's, no different than than the city says you can build a medical clinic here um, on this site, but the city doesn't have anything to do with it to ensure that Doc Greg, you know, Dr. Greg Hooksma working in there has a current medical license. Um, right. And because, and I think it's obviously important for the public to understand that because that these are high risk kind of situations, you know, with domestic violence, very high risk situation. Um, and you know, with homelessness, you know, one of the largest contributors is dual diagnosis people with mental health disorders and drug addiction. 
So, so obviously you have to have skilled people inside of those facilities, um, you know, working and, and working with the population. So, um, I, I guess it would be great to have an absolute reassurance that what you're saying, Carl, is true, <laughs> but but it also seems pretty reasonable to make that as a as a as a pretty solid assumption. You know, I was just thinking as this was all we're talking about this. I think another recommendation that could be made and put under both sections would be that these the facilities must abide by all applicable um, state and local regulations and obtain all applicable state and local licenses. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's a good um, that's a good catch all. You know, and there's one other item that in talking with the building official and the police chief about this that we could consider putting in under both sections would be it is within our right to have an annual uh, safety inspection of all of these facilities and so that we did not previously include that in the ordinance but that could allow for um, the police chief or his designee or the building official and his designee to go in once annually to ensure um, health safety et cetera is being uh, adhered to. And I believe that Bonnie Lake ended up adding that to their ordinance regarding this as well. Sounds good. Katrina, I also noticed uh, Redmond had an ordinance that had occupational requirements uh, at a fairly detailed level that would be certainly worth looking at. Um, that's kind of where I got my thoughts on it. Because uh, we're talking about some places that could have some potentially um, uh, individuals that might be at risk to themselves and to the community. And I think we're, we have an obligation to you know, look after the welfare of our, of our citizens, uh, all of them, all, in all categories, but uh, you got to have a good plan. You got to have the right people in place to make sure that all comes off smoothly and with, without any kind of... Um, bad outcomes. So I thank you for that. I'd be interested if you'd like to send that along to to us to, to take a look at that. I know that we were hoping to get a recommendation from the commission tonight, but with the amount of questions that are have come up, Chair, I'd just like to offer that perhaps we come back with we could come back with answers to some of those, but also a proposed motion based on what the commission members have said at your next meeting that the commission could say yay or nay, and then we can move it to council. It seems like, I mean, there's a couple, many of these things I would feel comfortable drafting into the ordinance, but there's some that I think, you know, especially the one that we need, I would need to talk to legal counsel before knowing for sure. I think it may be come back at the next meeting and have you review a, a, rec, a prepared recommendation and give some additional answers? Yeah, I, I think there's been pretty robust discussion here this evening and, and lots of questions. And so I think bringing it back, we have until April, I believe, because um, uh, that's when the interim ordinance expires. And um, so we're not pressed for time on that. Um, so, so I think if you do exactly what you just suggested, you know, do your check, provide it for our next agenda, and it could, it shouldn't take much time. Um, well, you know, obviously we'll have an opportunity to read it before the, the meeting and um, give it a quick thumbs up. Perfect. I think that that would be best and we can draft up the recommendation. You all can read it, make amendments to it. Then not everybody has to offer an amendment to the ordinance right now. Okay. Well, thanks so much and uh, lots of great questions. I appreciate that the preparation and thought that you all put into this uh, as always. So um, I think we're gonna have a good uh, work product to deliver to uh, the council. Uh, just one question, um, are we, so are we continuing the hearing then or are we going to actually close the public hearing tonight? The chair closed the hearing at the 
completion of the testimony. That's right. Okay. Thanks, Katrina. Okay. Chair, I'm happy All to right. provide an update on the housing bill that I think Commissioner Brown was referring to. Oh, to sure. You. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So there was a, a bill that was introduced on behalf of the governor in the Senate and the House this year. It had different uh, mandates in it for cities over 100,000, over 20,000, and then over 10,000 people. Uh, for the city of Gig Harbor, these bills would have required us to amend our zoning code to allow duplexes on every single family residential lot within the city, which is over 60% of our lands. This would also have preempted um, anyone from challenging their neighbors from converting their single family home to a duplex. It also would have precluded um, HOA CCNRs. So if you were in an HOA where you thought your neighbor couldn't convert to a duplex, uh, they would have been able to convert to a duplex within the city. Um, for various reasons, the city was very strongly opposed to these bills and we've taken a very strong stance with AWC, the Association of Washington Cities, as well as with our uh, legislative coalition here uh, we'll say that Michelle Caldier, Emily Randall, and Jesse Young have been very supportive of the city's position on this. Um, it, uh, well, I'll leave my personal remarks out. It problematic from the perspective of uh, the Growth Management Act is really a bottom-up approach to planning, where it's it's given to you know there's general parameters such as from the state demographer, these, this is the population that we expect to grow over the next 20 years. Now plan for that only. Um, but other than that, the, the state, uh, the planning law is local areas have the right to plan for themselves. The citizens through public participation can craft development regulations, goals and policies for how they see their future in their community. And so very strongly on the basis of that, we opposed the bill very, very strongly. The mayor did testify along with um, 14 other local mayors of cities in opposition to this bill when it was heard in the house. Um, the same day that that happened, we found out that it did not make it out of the Senate Ways and Means Committee. So effectively it died in the Senate, did not go to the floor. Um, it did make it out of the local government committee on the House side, and um, we had a plan going forward, again, strong plan from a city perspective to have this either strongly amended or um, for it to not survive the session. And um, two days ago, we were informed that we were successful, and it did not make it to a vote, it did not make it to the time it would need to go to the opposite chamber. And that bill is dead for this year. So that is really good news from a um, kind of local control bottom up planning approach. However, we do expect this bill to come back next session, uh, potentially the same bill potentially modified. There was some um, scrambling at the last moment between the sponsors of the bill to remove cities under 20,000, because that is where a lot of the opposition came from. Um, something that we put forward was to align it more with um, Puget Sound Regional Council's Vision 2050 and how they allocate population. Um, the most population goes to the metro cities of Seattle, Tacoma, Everett, um, and Bremerton and, and so on and so forth. But the majority of the population as it's currently allocated region wide is around I-5 and mass transit. And again, that matches infrastructure investments and plans and so on and so forth. So there, there's a very strong potential this will come back. We will be working with our lobbyists and AWC in the interim um, with the proponents of this bill to have um, kind of local jurisdictions, particularly small city um, perspective be heard. And they're, they're, they were willing to hear it now, not all of them, but many of them were. Um, so 
it's good news for now. We don't need to worry about changing the zoning code um, to allow for duplexes. Now, we're not going to take our site off of this one because we do anticipate it will be coming back. And um, I will keep you apprised of what we hear moving forward. Yeah, uh, thanks for that brief. And it was yeah, like keep a your ears open. Full time job for a while. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Keep your, keep your ears open, and um, I did I did write a letter myself to uh, uh, Michelle Caldier, um, and so th there's a there's a couple of uh, our council members, Ginny Wook and uh, Robin Denson. If you follow their Facebook pages, you know, do a really good job of um, debriefing what went on at council meetings, and you know, keeping you um, uh, abreast of things like you know, like this uh, house bill that Katrina just, or this proposed, whatever it was called. Um, the missing metal. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, anyway, we've slayed the dragon temporarily anyway. Yes. But, and, and here's a, a, a tidbit for you that Gig Harbor, and I forget what the time frame was, I think it was a 10 year time frame was um, the second fastest growing um, city in the entire state. And if you, uh, the, the first one was, I can't remember who it was, but they're uh, a huge, which set? Redmond. Yeah, and a huge chunk of their growth was because they annexed uh, one of their UGAs. And so if you take that away, um, Gig Harbor by far was the most rapidly growing uh, community in the entire state. Um, and the, the numbers are staggering. We've already exceeded our 2030 goals. Um, we've already exceeded them, not just met them, but exceeded them. So this is, this is an important thing, at least from my, obviously I am offering my personal perspective here, um, but it, it is an important thing to keep your eye on um, as we move forward. Totally agree. I, I was invited to sit in on Representative Paulette's. He had a stakeholder committee of several um, local community development planning directors, um, the governor's office, uh, AWC, the master builders, realtors were all, they had representatives invited. And I will say testimony given was very striking on behalf of Gig Harbor in saying that because we could, I could point out a direct impact of this bill we received a letter, you know, a few years ago from PSRC saying you're growing too fast. If you don't slow it down, you're not going to be eligible for federal transportation dollars. And yet we have a state law that's telling us you must allow duplexes on every single family lot. And so we were really, if this had passed, we were going to be caught between a rock and a hard place because our capacity would increase within the city that would lead to more growth. Um, and that was very powerful, especially you know, talking about, you know, do we really want the outlying areas growing as fast as Gig Harbor, Sumner, Bonnie Lake have been growing? Because Bonnie Lake and Sumner have also been growing at a, not as much as at the pace that we have, but very substantially as well. And, you know, the answer on, from a GMA perspective, as well as a Vision 2050 perspective is no, they want the outlying areas to grow slower so that they can focus in for, uh, infrastructure investments on the core, which is where they want the growth to occur. So I, I don't think a bill will be successful if it is this one size fits all approach coming forward. I think that that at least was heard loud and clear from um, especially powerful with all of the mayors testifying um, that Saturday morning. Okay. Well, it's always nice to end on happy news. Um, so uh, other business, next meeting. I have a process question for Katrina um, to send you something that as a result of this meeting, maybe some language from another city, do I send it to you and then you make it available to the rest of the commission or do you just take the information and use it to craft another alternative? What's the best way for me to proceed, basically? Um, send it to me, and then I will communicate 
or Michelle or Carl will communicate your suggestion um, as an FYI to the commission, but I will take it into the recommendation that I'll be drafting. Um, and that's a really good question. We do have a new senior planner that started with us on Monday. Her name is Roxy Robles. She comes to us from Kitsap County. She's previously worked um, Woodenville um, and some other places. She's very dynamic. So these things will not always be coming from me. You won't always have to hear from me or, or Carl. I know you like us maybe, but there'll be other faces that will be um, presenting to you in short order as we're beginning to work on all of the other items that are on the work plan. But yes, if you can send at least ones pertaining to this through me since I'm tackling this issue currently. Okay. Next meeting, March 2nd. March 2nd, Chair, it'll be a, a study session on short-term rentals. Um, and we'll be talking largely about comments that we've heard um, and we'll have some answers prepared to some of the questions that were asked at the last meeting. So that's a uh, Wednesday, right? I think right? it's March 3rd, actually. We, we, we had to move the meeting to uh, Wednesday, March 2nd, due to okay. uh, another um, engagement that's going on at the city. Uh, there's an open house for, um, for uh, city administrator candidates. And so, uh, so that we wouldn't um, take away from that event, we decided to move this meeting to, to Wednesday, March 2nd. And I believe, I believe that we polled the group to make sure that was the commission. Right. Yeah. Sure was okay. Now that you mentioned that, I, I, um, my brain fog has cleared. Thank you. And any and all of you are welcome at the reception to meet the candidates for city administrator on the 3rd at 530. There'll be light refreshments. And I think we'll, we're bringing in three or four potential city administrators. So if you'd like to come meet them, you're welcome. Okay. Well, another night of good work, folks. Appreciate it. And um, without, unless there's any further thoughts from anybody, I'm willing to entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. Seconded by Grina. All those in favor, say aye. 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 The vote is unanimous. The Planning Commission meeting is officially adjourned at 7.13. Would you like to ask your question again, Chair? Yeah, um, I just was wondering what your thoughts were um, after our combined meeting with um, the city council members. I, I thought it was really, really productive. I enjoyed meeting all those people and I think it was really helpful for them to see who we are and that we actually have something to contribute. I know it's not, you know, it's not their fault what happened in the past, but I think it was important for that to happen. Yeah, thanks. Rick, I think it was it was good to meet those people because there's been a, a lot of turnover on the council. So I was really glad to uh, get to attach the names to faces and hear what they had to say. I concur. Yeah. Yep, here, here. It was nice to hear also what some of their priorities are, what each of them kind of have different things going on that their interests are. Yeah. I was impressed to hear all the uh, extensive resumes of the plan commissioners. That was a <laughs> pretty impressive group. I mean, I knew you were, but you know. <laughs> That's what Carl and I were talking about the next day. Yeah. I, day. I we already knew, like you said, Commissioner Soltis, we already knew that, but it was impressive to hear all of your backgrounds like like that. And and, and as well as the uh, council members as well. It's, mm -hmm. We've got a, a couple of uh, really impressive groups here, so. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, from my perspective, I, I, I couldn't have scripted it any better um, as far as the interchange, the openness, the um, uh, 
true um, passionate understanding of the council members about um, what what we had been through and what we had to offer them and and the way that they saw us as um, a, a critical um, group and tool to to help them do their best job so um, it, I think it was just a, a, a fabulous evening and a fabulous outcome. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Well, it was one of the best thoughts. meetings in a long time. It was, <laughs> we were very proud to be part of it. Yeah, well, thanks. Thanks for, um, uh, what's the word? Um, not organizing it. Facilitating? First, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, for, <laughs> thanks for facilitating it. <laughs> I'm getting old. <laughs> All right, folks, you can turn the recording back off again.